We welcome everyone to this installment of the Department of Fish and Wildlife's Conservation Lecture Series. My name is Whitney Albright and I work in the Science Institute here at the department and help to organize the lecture series along with my colleague Nicole Russell, who's also on the line. And um, before we get started today, I do want to just give a few quick um, ground rules, go over a few logistics before I introduce our guest speaker. So in a minute here, I'll turn it over to our speaker. We'll have a presentation for about 40, 45 minutes to an hour, and then we'll have a dedicated time for Q&A. Um, so do please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box throughout the presentation. We may answer a couple along the way, but we'll save the majority of the questions for the end of the presentation. And there is a chat box and a Q&A box, which I realize is a little bit confusing, but if you would please type any questions into the Q&A box, that will help us to more easily keep track of those. And then we'll relay those to um, the speakers here at the end. A couple of other things to note, you probably noticed that you are muted and that is to help us preserve the audio quality for our recording. So we are recording the talk today and it will be posted to our lecture series website, specifically the archive page within a couple of weeks after the lecture. So if you'd like to view it again, or if you know of someone that missed it, but might want to tune in, please feel free to direct them there. And here's a link, a hyperlink here at the bottom of the screen. All right, so without further ado, I am very excited to announce or introduce our speaker today, Corey Gray. Corey has been working in habitat conservation in the Bay Delta region for over 20 years. And in the cannabis, cannabis program here at the Department of Fish and Wildlife since 2017. She currently supervises one of many teams in the watershed enforcement program, which consists of scientists that assist CFW law enforcement with data collection that's needed to pursue and prosecute illegal cannabis operations in the Bay Area and North Coast. So very excited to have Corey here today to talk with us a little bit about her work. And with that, Corey, I will stop sharing my screen and I will turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm very excited to be able to provide this presentation this afternoon. I'm going to share my screen and then uh, stop my video. Um, I, I will try and stop a couple times throughout the presentation if there's some um, burning questions that need to be answered. Um, and without further ado, let us begin. Hopefully, Whitney, you guys can see my presentation. So thank you, Whitney. Um, welcome. Uh, again, my name is Corey Gray or Corinne Gray, if you're looking at my email. I've been here and working in the department for multiple years and have the privilege today of being able to talk about our statewide cannabis program within the department. Uh, we in the department, our mission is to manage our diverse fish and wildlife resources and the habitats on they depend upon for not just their ecological values, but also for their enjoyment by the public. Why is our department so deeply involved in the cannabis operations? Well, there's multiple reasons. Uh, cannabis is a very high water need plant, which grows uh, during the summer period. And those periods are when we're seeing summer low flows in our watersheds. Uh, illegal grow sites are often in hidden rural wilderness areas uh, without much access. Uh, sites are often fertilized with uh, pesticides, trash and fertilizer, and um, those types of things can adversely affect wildlife. And we often find poached wildlife in those areas, which our department is uh, uh, specifically can address. We often find trespass grows on our own properties. And we already have existing permitting authorities, which allow us to help reduce, minimize, and mitigate environmental impacts associated with up, up those operations. So all of these particular tasks uh, make us uniquely situated to help uh, work with the cannabis environment and protect our natural resources. So as because there are so many aspects of the cannabis, uh, cannabis growing that can affect us, we have multiple different um, aspects of our own cannabis program that are uh, 
situated to address that. So for example, we have our own permitting, we have a monitoring component, uh, outreach, we also have grants and our own land steward, stewardship staff, and of course, uh, enforcement staff. And uh, we're gonna go through all of those programs as part of this presentation. So here is um, an organizational chart of our California Department of Fish and Wildlife Cannabis Program. And as mentioned before, you can see that this is a very broad and varied program that really touches on all aspects of what our own department has historically handled. So we have staff in each of our regions uh, that handle both permitting and enforcement. We also have um, staff in each of the branches, Habitat Conservation, Water Branch, Fisheries and Wildlife um, for different components, whether it be permitting, monitoring or enforcement assistance. We have um, our own public information officer, Janice Mackey, uh, who out of our Office of Education and Outreach and our own uh, legal representation out of our OGC. All of these different aspects make the cannabis programs unique in that we have multiple uh, people in multiple programs that are tasked to with one under one program to to handle our cannabis uh, growing in the state. So the beginning of all of this, even though our department has actually uh, been handling and dealing with illegal and illicit cannabis cannabis growth statewide for decades, um, it really got exciting in 2016 when Proposition 64 was passed and uh, recreational cannabis was uh, legalized. So in November of 2016, it was passed, but the Bureau, uh, I'm sorry, the Cannabis Bureau or the Department of Fish, Food and Agriculture did not have uh, licensing available until 2018. So as part of the legislature recognizing that the department was uh, uniquely situated to address cannabis uh, operations, they all they basically found that uh, they also recognized that environmental impacts from cannabis cultivation, especially those unlawful uh, diversions, ha were having detrimental effects on fish and wildlife. And they charged us, or we are charged to protect those resources for the benefit of California. It, they recognize that rem remediation and permitting of these cannabis cultivation activities are complex and would require additional staff and resources. Uh, those resources were needed to address unlawful water diversions and other fishing game code violations. And this fishing game code section established the watershed enforcement teams that were intended to facilitate the investigation and enforcement of those illegal operations. It also recognized that this is a multi-agency affair and that there should be a permanent multi-agency task force between both the, all of the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the State Water Resources Control Board, and the Department of Cannabis Cultivation, which was formally uh, covered under the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Um, and it also recognized that the department should and could establish an enhanced fee schedule for 1600 permitting. So a majority of our program is funded under the Cannabis Tax Fund. And uh, effectively this is for uh, cannabis growers who are growing and selling uh, their products are taxed and uh, we are allowed to be funded under there. We are have we are do have some portion of our funding is under the lake and, existing lake and stream bed alteration agreement program, uh, because a good portion of what we do is uh, receive and address applications under our lake and stream bed alteration agreement program. So illegal cannabis impacts. Uh, basically, there's a full range of illegal cannabis impacts that we are intended to address. Uh, can go anywhere from land clearing, obviously stream impacts. Uh, again, those pesticides and other materials that we're seeing in these watersheds can have adverse effects on any, everything from our smallest bugs up to our largest mammals, such as bears, as you can see in this picture on the left-hand side. Stream diversions. So stream diversions aren't necessarily inherently evil, um, but it's all dependent upon how and when it's done. Um, as you, as everyone knows, and our 
state of California, because of our Mediterranean climate, um, a majority of our water we receive during the winter, but, um, but our biggest growing season for most agriculture, including cannabis, is during our summer, summer period. So one of the issues that are that we found early on with cannabis is that because it was not legalized for quite some time, a lot of these operations were hidden up in these upper watersheds in these rural areas. And as such, there wasn't much in the way of existing infrastructure to help with um, irrigation of those crops. And so one of the biggest issues we're finding was some incredibly creative ways of storing and diverting water in these upper sensitive watersheds to irrigate, irrigate cannabis grows. Uh, what we also found is that these stream diversions were occurring in upper watersheds where some of our most sensitive species were still occurring. And because there hadn't been much in the way of agricultural pressure in these upper watersheds, there were a lot of sensitive species that were being adversely affected by these types of stream diversions. As mentioned before, poached and poisoned wildlife is a huge issue. Um, again, because these, these cannabis operations were occurring in these upper watersheds in these rural areas, there was a lot of predation um, and a lot of issues associated with those types of grows. And because of that, we saw a lot of um, pesticide and um, other, other ways of dealing with wildlife predation. These pesticides that we were finding, finding in these upper watersheds, um, because they were not regulated by the state of California, um, people were getting pretty creative. There are a lot of pesticides that we were seeing that were not necessarily even legal to use in California, let alone legal to use in uh, the country. And these pesticides were being brought from outside the country to use on these types of cannabis grows. What we were also seeing was large quantities of fertilizer. Um, because these grows were being, these grows were occurring in locations that weren't historically used as agriculture. There's a reason for it. Um, they were having to bring in large amounts of fertilizers to make sure that those plants were able to survive. So at, as Prop 64 came into place and cannabis was legalized, there was a recognition that our stream bed alteration agreement program was uniquely situated to address the, some of the adverse impacts associated with those types of activities. And so the legislature determined that um, in order to receive a license from the Department of Cannabis Control, that a grower must comply with section 1600 of the Fish and Game Code. Um, and effectively, in order to receive a license, they would either have to have a final stream bed alteration agreement from our department, a draft agreement, or a letter or some type of written response from us indicating that they did not need a stream bed alteration agreement. As you can imagine, that created a pretty massive uh, amount of work for our department as thousands upon thousands of these stream bed alteration agreements were coming in the door um, at, at a relatively quick rate, especially prior to the 2018 um, the 2018 uh, moment when they were able to get licenses through CDFA. So in order to track these large numbers of stream bed alteration agreements, one of the things that came out of the cannabis program was the environmental permitting and information management system. You're welcome to those who have had to work with it, um, but it has some amazing opportunities to, to allow us to have people come and submit applications online, track those applications through the system and it better able allows us to report those permits um, out to the legislature and others who are interested. Another huge component of our permitting also is our outreach and grower education. Uh, our permitting staff are usually uh, are very deeply involved in doing those types of outreach and grower education moments. Uh, so here's some examples of the types of applications or the number of applications that we're receiving. Um, if you can see uh, on the right-hand side, the number of applications per region in uh, our state. And as you can obviously see, region one, which covers the Emerald Triangle, does re receive above and beyond more applications than anyone else. But what you can also see from this is almost every region is receiving applications for 
uh, cannabis grows as those cannabis growers attempt to get licensed. So I'm gonna pause here to see if anybody has any questions. No question, oh, I spoke too soon. Oh, quick clarification question for you. What is the Emerald Triangle? Uh, the Emerald Triangle is uh, those counties in our North, North Coast where uh, prior to legalization, uh, a majority of our cannabis uh, was growing was occurring. So you can see from this map on the left that kind of conglomeration or that grouping of permit applications on the North Coast, and that's effectively the Emerald Triangle area. Great, thank you. Um, we had another question, um, Corey, if you wanna answer this one now or later, up to you. Um, what is the LE side of the program look like? The org chart did not show LE, did it? Um, I'm assuming that's the law enforcement side. Correct, um, that was the um, scientist side. And I do have a slide later on in the pre presentation that goes over our really critical and an important law enforcement aspect of the program. So we'll be speaking to that in a moment. Excellent, and that's it for now. Thank you. So one of the things that our legis uh, legislation also recognized is the need for us or, and our unique ability to monitor for cannabis cultivation and to look at the potential, potentially significant adverse impacts of it. Um, as part of that, we have the California Environmental Monitoring and Assessment Framework, which is really an, a, um, an exciting opportunity for our department. It is a program that covers multiple branches throughout the department. And the intent is to look at and quantify the um, potential adverse impacts associated with cannabis cultivation. As part of that, um, they are looking to understand certain things that are influenced by cannabis cultivation and other ecological drivers, such as aquatic, riparian, and terrestrial habitats. Uh, so as part of that, we do have um, people within the program that are both from our wildlife branch as well as our fisheries branch. Uh, the community composition and structure, regionally relevant species, um, in-stream flow thresholds for, in, uh, again, to address those stream diversions and other water quality parameters that might be affected by cannabis, and also, and ultimately, to address the potential, potentially cumulative effects of cannabis operations. Some of the field methods that our CMAF group are utilizing are pressure transducers and dissolved oxygen sensors to get at water quality issues, snorkel surveys to look at presence absence of sensitive species, bioassessment to again address water quality um, issues and looking at flow criteria in each of these systems. There's also a pretty a, a remarkably large terrestrial field method uh, component of CMATH where we're looking at camera traps, drift, front, drift fences with camera traps and acoustic recorders, all trying to get at that issue of how and whether cannabis cultivators are affecting terrestrial resources. Vegetation film methods such as railway or rapid assessment surveys, looking at uh, plants as well as uh, rapid assessment and reconnaissance surveys in each of these unique vegetations surrounding the site. At this point, um, the CMAF it, framework is currently um, in its pilot season in 2021. Um, and that is focused mostly right now in the Bay Area and North Coast but the, the ultimate goal is to expand those types of monitoring efforts statewide. They're also in the process of, uh, we do have imagery and in some of these sensitive watersheds, they are going through and digitizing cultivation sites, which is effectively going through that imagery, whether it be um, off, off Google recent or through our own, own contracts to put polygons around um, cultivation sites. And this is really beneficial because it allows us to um, assess 
uh, potential cumulative impacts in those watersheds. Looking, we can look at uh, water usage uh, and things along that line. So ultimately, um, the hope is to collect some of baseline data within those uh, study areas to expand and improve our understanding of the effects of regulated cultivation on these aquatic and terrestrial systems to continue to develop these cross-disciplinary collaborations, those opportunities for multiple branches within our own department to talk, communicate, and work together to develop this framework, uh, to collect some long-term data sets that could help address multiple management concerns, even though we are looking to uh, specifically at cannabis cultivation in these watersheds, the science the, uh, and the data that's being collected as part of these efforts can be utilized by other programs um, and other people to address ongoing environmental um, impacts associated with um, other types of activities. Um, this type of information is, kind of, is critical for our own department and others to develop permit conditions and other management terms that are going to minimize the adverse effects of cannabis on the environment. It's going to help us focus our remediation and restoration efforts on those watersheds that have um, the highest impacts and where we can get the best um, uh, the best results from our restoration efforts. And of course, it can be used for our enforcement staff and our outreach priorities to look at those um, critical watersheds and those areas that have the most impacts um, to, to make sure that we're addressing those on the enforcement side as well. From the beginning, uh, outreach has been uh, a very critical component of our program. And there have been multiple permitting workshops and industry events. Uh, as you all know, because we, we're dealing with a really uh, special and different type of industry in that it's an industry that, because of its pre previous legal status, um, was kind of in the shadows. And so we've had to do a lot of work to kind of reach out to those growers to help them get into the legal system. Um, so there are multiple ways in which we've been able to do so. Janice Mackey is, is our dedicated public information officer and has been critical to uh, putting together these efforts. So some examples, uh, we've done uh, several workshop and industry events statewide. Um, wherever we think uh, a cannabis grower is going to be, that's where we like to be as well to communicate um, our multiple roles in, in the process and to allow people to ask questions about the process. Uh, we've gone to several Emerald Cups. We've hosted multiple speaker panels and had tables at summits and expos. Uh, we're really doing the best we can to make sure that our department is out there and is available to these communities to discuss the process. Um, there's also a lot of interest from outsiders within our state and outside of our state about how it's going. Uh, you know, we are one of the, we are definitely the largest, but we are one of the first states to legal, legalize cannabis. And there's a lot of attention from outside groups on how we're handling it, permitting, dealing with um, illegal and illicit cannabis grows and things along that line. So there are many, many um, requests from outside of our department um, that Janice and the team has uh, handled. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see we've even made it on 60 Minutes. So here's some examples of just the vast, uh, the vast quantity of press coverage that the cannabis program and the department have been receiving. Um, as mentioned before, the, the world is watching. We're also trying to get out the message through social media uh, at any place that we can uh, try to reach out to growers and to the public at large, we're, we're utilizing. Uh, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Um, people like to know about our enforcement efforts and um, our, our Facebook posts seem to be pretty well, well received. Um, using Instagram is, has been kind of a, a helpful way for us to reach out to cultivators. So what we've also tried to do is highlight those growers who are going above and beyond and who are helping, uh, who, who not only are coming into uh, and getting regulated, 
uh, through the multiple different agencies that do so, but who are also uh, using techniques that in some cases can actually enhance the environment for our fish and wildlife resources. And at this point, we are going to show you a video that highlights one such situation. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Casali, owner and operator of Huckleberry Hill Farms in Southern Humboldt. One of the most important hurdles that I overcame was really just trying to make my farm environmental friendly. And in doing that, it really made every different process and every different agency that I dealt with once I became an environmental friendly farm, um, it just made everything go that much smoother. Once I established my rainwater catchment ponds, versus using an in-stream water diversion technique. It just made everything that much smoother for me. The rainwater catchment ponds that I have here on my farm, one's 175,000 gallons, the other one right here is 275,000. So I have 450,000 ga gallons of rainwater storage that I've collected over the winter time. And it's super important for, for this farm to preserve any amount of water that I, that I would otherwise have taken out of the in-stream channels during the summer. And so this was probably the single most valuable thing that I did to my farm um, and the most helpful for the creeks and the tributaries that are on both sides of my property. Um, this pond here is stocked with some trout and it's just adds to the experience of my farm and my tours that I give every day. But I think it's really important to stay open-minded and to be patient and to realize that not only are we learning, and this is totally different for us, but it's also new and, and, and different for the, the regulatory people. So um, just being open-minded and working with them and talking with them and, and being true and honest is really important in, in really having them want to end up ultimately helping you because you're doing the right thing. I just want to say thank you to Department of Fish and Wildlife for really changing history here. This is something, this is an opportunity that I appreciate and I know that it's hard for, for both sides to come together and to work together. And in working together, it's really showing the different farmers that we can do this, we can make history together, we can protect the environment together. And it's not gonna be about them and us, it's gonna be about all of us. And uh, so that's what's really important here for me. Okay, well, thank you. Let's move on unless there's any burning questions at this moment as well. Let's see, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, would you like to answer those now, Corey, or do you wanna wait till the end? Sure, that's fine. Okay, um, one question here is about the video. Um, it says, that's great that Huckleberry Hill Farm collects rainwater instead of using in-stream diversions but that water would have eventually found its way into streams. Any comment on that issue, especially as we face yet another critical drought year? Yeah, and that is, that is a, a good portion of what we do as a department is attempt to help and answer that particular question. Because as, as I mentioned before, it's, it's really all about the timing of, uh, of that water usage. And so yes, during the winter period, uh, that water would have normally flown down, flowed downstream, but there is more water available in the winter, the theory being that amount of water would not be quite as substantial as if that same amount of water were being diverted during the summer period when we have lower flows. Um, so, so with all of our uh, water and stream diversion issues, it's a question of timing. Um, you know, statewide, we have a really large, robust infrastructure that attempts to resolve that for our larger agricultural industry, where we're, we have a series of dams that kept, capture snow, snow melt and others um, to store that water and make it available during the summer period. Um, so we're just seeing those kind of um, actions or opportunities on these cannabis grows on a smaller scale. It's, it's all about adjusting that timing of those diversions. 
And we've got one more quick question here. Um, this question came in when you were talking about the CMAF, the monitoring protocols. Um, Aaron asks, are the draft CMAF protocols available anywhere to CDFW staff? Uh, they should be. I, I will have to defer to uh, CMAF, uh, the program, but um, my understanding is that is available to the, to the departmental staff in draft form. Um, if there's anybody from the program on this call who could answer that, I'd appreciate it. Great, I'll see if I can follow up with that, Corey, and also connect with Aaron. Great, thank you so much. All right, back to you. So another component, as mentioned before, of our program are, is our grants program. And you can see these are before and after photos, some of the work that was done through our grants program uh, to, to clean up some of these illicit cannabis growth sites on public lands. And in, my apologies, one moment, please. Uh, so as of, from the beginning, we've provided about $2 million towards these types of cleanup efforts. Um, and we have uh, cleaned up and restored over 150 sites with illegal cannabis on it in the last three years. So as part of these efforts, we've removed over 100,000 pounds or 100 miles of poly pipe and planted over 700 trees. So this is a really exciting opportunity for our department to um, help assist with some of those locations where illicit cannabis growing was occurring. Uh, we found it, we were able to go out and do eradication, but because um, there's no either no landowner available or the people who are doing the growing are in the wind, um, there's not money or people available to do that type of cleanup. And so our grants program is trying to fill that gap. In 2021, so this year, our current solicitation, we've received another seven applications and those have requested up to $1.5 million for um, prior, uh, cleaning up and remediation of illicit cannabis sites. And, um, looking at opportunities to enhance watersheds and other communities where cultivation occurs. So ultimately the goal of our grant program has always been to support partnerships for cleanup, remediation and restoration of environmental damage. Um, but we're also looking at developing funding priorities to address uh, some other types of barriers that we're seeing between uh, getting growers out of the dark and into a legal cannabis cultivation. Um, also helping uh, legal cannabis growers continue or expand environmental stewardship and st sustainability options. As mentioned before, our goal is to support qualified cultivators with environmentally sustainable practices. And so as part of that, we are definitely encouraging people to transition from provisional licenses to annual licenses under the Department of Cannabis Cultivation. We want them to find more and better ways to do sustainable water con consumption in these sensitive watersheds, look at waste management, and address integrated pest and disease management in these sites. We're also out on these properties and dealing with a lot of historical um, impacts associated with culvert installation and dam building and grading. Um, so helping communities uh, install proper erosion control and looking at opportunities to enhance and, uh, and protect repairing corridors is also critical. Another component of our department's cannabis program is land stewardship. Uh, our department actually owns and manages over a million acres of property in the state. And as part of that, we are obligated to maintain and 
patrol those pr properties. Unfortunately, a lot of times when we were given those properties, we were not necessarily given the funds to do all of the work necessary to keep those properties in good condition, whether it be fence building or um, trash removal, things along that line. So in recognition of that, the cannabis program also uh, high, has developed a pretty impressive land stewardship program where we actually have specific people in each region whose sole job is to uh, look at, it, maintain our lands and look for those illegal cannabis grows. And if so, um, clean those up. So they're doing a lot of work with our own law enforcement, um, looking at these types of trespass grows, um, building fences to discourage those types of grows from our property, um, and also clearing uh, garbage and other materials from unauthorized encampments on our property. Um, it, there's a lot of work that goes into maintaining 3 million acres of property in our state and our lands, uh, our lands division is, is helping us with that when it comes to cannabis operations. Also with our land stewardship, there's some special activities that they're conducting. They're, they've developed a lands inspection application, um, which is utilizing our tablets to look at our lands and to keep track of where we've inspected and what we're seeing out there. It's actually, being, it's actually really beneficial for, for all um, that they're able to develop this. So we're getting a better understanding of, of what's on our lands and what needs to be, um, uh, what type of infrastructure needs to be built, things along that line. Here's an example of the types of activities that our lands program is doing. A lot of it's just general inspection, getting out on those pro properties. Sometimes they see a specific issue, a fence or a gate that needs repairing. Um, could be other types of, of infrastructure issues that they're looking for. Um, some, a lot of what we do is going out there and finding illicit cannabis grows and removing that um, the materials that um, are out on our properties. Um, if there are opportunities for remediation and restoration, our lands, pro uh, lands program is also working on that as well. So last but not least is our cannabis enforcement program. Though we, you know, this is being discussed at the end of our presentation, it's actually one of the first ways that we got involved when it comes to cannabis um, in California. And it's a really um, unique program in that it is an opportunity for both our existing enforcement staff and new enforcement staff and our science staff to work together. Uh, we do a lot of close collaboration as the scientists with our law enforcement staff. A lot of what we do is try to um, help them uh, detect and target illicit cannabis grows in um, our most sensitive watersheds. Here's an example of some of the work that we've been able to do as scientists. This is, a, um, this is in Mendocino County, the Emerald Triangle as mentioned before. And as you can see, we uh, took some of our mapped, uh, some of our aerial imagery and in this one location mapped about 500 different parcels that had um, illicit uh, cannabis on it. And as you can imagine, it's a little difficult and there aren't enough resources for us to target 500 different parcels. And so we work with existing information to try and uh, prioritize those enforcement actions in um, some of these more sensitive watersheds. Uh, you'll forgive me uh, because I do work in the North Coast and the Bay Area, most of my information is focused there, but these types of operations and activities are, occur are occurring throughout our state. Um, we are working with our partner agencies, the state board, as well as um, the Department of Cannabis control to prioritize watersheds. This is actually, you can find it online. These are some of the sensitive watersheds that um, we've looked at. We're trying to find areas that have critical habitat. Um, watershed, uh, watercourses with low flow conditions that are going to be adversely impacted by surface diversions. 
Um, places where there's critical water supplies. A lot of these illicit grows, as mentioned before, have pesticides and other chemicals um, on site that could then flow and um, develop issues with uh, water sources. And even though we recognize that these types of watersheds here are sensitive, the unfortunate reality is a majority of our watersheds in California are sensitive. And we are also being trying to be responsive to complaints that might fall outside of these particular watersheds. So our enforcement uh, officers are, there's about 60 officers in the program statewide. There's seven different squads that deal with uh, enforcement on private land. There's also one MET team, which comprises about five to eight officers. And that team is focused on trespass grows, not just on our own lands, but also on any other state or federally owned lands. And all of these um, enforcement staff are um, from that dedicated funding from state cannabis taxes. So some of the statistics from 2020, recognizing that um, because of COVID, you would think that um, the, you know, a lot of us weren't getting out in the field, but our enforcement staff and scientists were, it didn't slow down at all. So in 2020, uh, they had 11, over 1,100 cannabis, cannabis operations. Uh, they eradicated over 2.3 million plants. Uh, they seized over $4 million in currency. Uh, 566 firearms were seized in these operations. And uh, over 1,800 environmental violations were documented. Um, as part of these types of operations, the cleanup efforts re resulted in over 100,000 feet of poly pipe cleaned up, over 30, 36,000 pounds of trash, over 7,000 pounds of fertilizer, um, 291 pesticide containers and 39 dams were removed and waterways were restored. Our program um, is unique, uniquely situated in that we are constantly collaborating and coordinating with a vast group of agencies, both on the law enforcement side and on the permitting side. And here's just an uh, a group of uh, just some, just a selection of some of those people that we are constantly coordinating with in our efforts. So I'm assuming that everybody has a lot of questions and what we're going to do is open up for questions and answers with our panelists. And we're very lucky to have um, in, on our panel today, Matthew Jones, who is our attorney from the Office of General Council who supports the cannabis program uh, for over the past year and a half. Matt has fielded the bulk of the department's administrative penalty cases referred by law enforcement, and he works closely with us to negotiate site remediation of illegal cannabis sites. We also have Captain Andrew Halverson, who leads and directs the law enforcement teams and the cannabis enforcement program throughout the state as well as Janice Mackey, who's our public information officer and handles a variety of outreach components, including media relations, permitting workshops, industry events, and more. All right, are we ready to get to some of these questions here? Hey, hearing no objections, let me pull these up. So there's one question I want to make sure I find before it gets buried. Oh, yeah. So Gabriel asks, is there a way for consumers to check where to purchase from legal growers um, or to check what growers they're purchasing from? I'm not sure if that's within your purview, Corey, but I wanted to relay it just in case. I do not know the answer to that question. I apologize. I don't know if anybody else does. Um, hi, this is Janice. Uh, I believe that on retail establishments, they have a, a QR code that you can scan your phone and check to see if the outlet is uh, a legal dispensary. And so uh, the Bureau of Cannabis Control is doing a lot of outreach to 
get consumers informed uh, with dispensaries are legal and which are not illegal. So there's been a huge outreach campaign on that. Interesting. That's a good question. Good to good to be mindful of that. Okay, let's see. Moving on here, I'm just going to kind of go down the list. Um, this first question, I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit. So Alex makes the comment that um, if one grower in an area um, goes legal, it can, um, the surrounding cultivators might not be happy about it due to some potential fallout, which can be a big obstacle. And so I think the question is, is there a way or, or outreach, maybe anything that is done to, to reach a group or kind of a bunch of neighboring farms all at once? And if we do kind of that kind of outreach. It looks like Matt. Oh yeah, yeah, Matthew, please, please go ahead. Feel I would just, uh, I was just going to respond to that. Um, in that, as far as trying to reach a group of geographically proximate landowners at once, I think you could make an argument that that's a lot of what LED is doing, uh, and it's and it's sort of, you know, they're going to target an area that might have multiple grows at the same time. And then if one or more of those grows decide to get legal, then that ends up in Corey's ballpark. And she she and her uh, counterparts throughout the state will shepherd that process as best we can. But as far as particularized outreach to specific locations, I don't know that that's occurring. But I, I think, I mean, if the, the point, the broader point is that's, sort of the entire process from both ends, but the permitting on one side and law enforcement on the other, the whole intent of all of it is to deter illegal cultivation and incentivize as many as we can to come into the, to the legal market. And I think I can speak on that and expand a little bit more. I, we're also, um, because of the drought, and drought conditions and the fact that these types of cannabis operations um, are diverting water. Uh, we are definitely um, working on uh, focusing not just enforcement in some cases, but also outreach um, in some of these more sensitive watersheds to see if we can get um, both tackle illegal operations who shouldn't be diverting at all um, but also communicate out with legal growers uh, so that they know that if there's any type of water conservation that they could implement, that we would, that we're here, we're available to help them figure out how to do that, and that we would encourage them to do so during this drought. And I can also add to that, that a lot of our outreach efforts uh, when we were doing in person uh, permitting workshops, we're definitely coordinated with the state water board so we can target areas uh -oh. with watersheds to help bring more people into the regulatory system. Janice, I caught most of that, but you were coming in and out a little bit, at least for me. Okay, sorry about that. There we uh, go. Be. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a lot of our uh, outreach efforts when we were doing. Uh, in-person permitting workshops were, um, were coordinated with the state water board so we could go into areas with sensitive watersheds and hold permitting workshops with the hopes of bringing more people into the regulatory side of, uh, of the cannabis industry. Great. All right. Um I'm gonna jump around a little bit here. And I noticed that um, Jennifer posted a comment in here. Um, she shared a link that you, where you can go to verify the legal status of cannabis businesses. Um, so I'll, I'll ask maybe Nicole, if you don't mind posting that into the chat so that everyone can see it um, and take a look if you're interested, that would be great. Thank you, Jennifer, for sharing that. Um, another question here, um, Ken says, you presented some statistics on eradication efforts, for example, the number of plants destroyed, cash seized, et cetera. Do you have data on how this compares to the total amount of illegal cultivation in the state? I think that 
we can say that unfortunately still uh, a vast majority of the cannabis grows we're seeing in some of these watersheds um, continue to be illegal. And um, when we do map some of these sensitive watersheds, um, we tend to find that you know, maybe 80%, sometimes 90% of the cannabis cultivations that we're mapping um, do not have any types of permits, um, whether or not they're complete or incomplete through the process. So unfortunately, um, you know, we, we are targeting as, as many sites and locations as we can, but we're still limited uh, by, by staff and just resources. And uh, that's why we're having to prioritize our watersheds um, because we are trying to target those that are having the greatest impact to resources and see if we can maximize the benefit from those types of enforcement operations. Um, you know, again, I think it, it it's, um, I don't know if Andrew wants to speak more on the enforcement side. Sure, and I would just say that the illegal cultivation is rampant and widespread. Um, I used to have a team and most of us were based out of Kern County and the six of us could have worked just in Kern County all year and we'd have way more than we could ever get to. and. We were, we, our area of responsibility covered probably eight counties. Um, so yeah, but I don't think anybody could put a number on how many illegal cultivation sites there are out there. They're, I mean, they're vast. You look what happens, you know, in LA County with the big operation a couple of weeks ago and then down in San Bernardino and Anza Borrego. I mean, they're, they're all over. All right. Um, Another question here, this is a few, a few questions wrapped into one, so I'll kind of break it down a little bit. Um, question is, it, it seems like you're focused um, largely on impacts to watersheds, but are there additional efforts being done for actual habitat that's degraded or significantly affected by these illegal grows, especially in desert upland regions where it can take years for habitat to be restored to, to previous conditions? Um, so that was the question and also kind of follow up who is responsible for the restoration. So this is Matt, I, I would address the second half of that first, which is to the extent we can identify a responsible party, we try to make them responsible for restoration of, of uh, whatever they've done to the land. Um, and as far as are they penalized or required to mitigate, uh, again, we, to the extent we're able to identify responsible parties, we do try to make that happen. Um, to the extent we can only identify a landowner, uh, we might be able to hold that person responsible for some amount of cleanup. Um, and then as far as penalize, that oftentimes falls to the county or the AG uh, in terms of criminal penalties. And then there are administrative penalties, which is the bulk of my work um, that get referred to OGC from law enforcement. And, uh, but we often, we often find that we're using those administrative penalties just as a, uh, you know, as leverage to actually get the property remediated because that's the primary goal. As far as the first half of that question, um, the, especially the desert upland regions, uh, that's obviously R5 and R6, that's entirely what they're, well, and R4 to some extent, that's pretty much entirely what they're doing. Um, Corey and her team work in a much wetter part of the state. So obviously their brains are in watersheds more than in desert upland areas. Um, there are, you know, there are some impacts that are, recognized in the fish and game code for habitat loss. They're a little bit, um, those cases are a little harder to make, let's say that, um, but they do exist, yes. So there is some of that activity going on in, in regions four, five, and six. Great. All right, we've got to all of those. I think we can, we can cross that one off. Thank you, Matt. Um, here's another question here. Um, let's see. 
and let's see, I'm not sure if this is within the purview of your programs, but I'm, I'll go ahead and relay it in case you, you are addressing this or maybe know of others, other partners that are. But Kevin asks, does the department have any plans to address the disparity between communities most impacted by the war on drugs versus the communities that are now profiting off of legal cannabis? So some dis disparities between the poor communities, um, communities of color that are most affected by, by this, despite equal rates of usage between, um, he says, white and people of color POC communities. And is that something that I guess comes up in your work or that, that we're addressing in any way? That's sort of more of a licensing issue and sort of more of DCC's um, bailiwick than ours. Mm -hmm. um, I think Corey did touch on that maybe being a potential goal of our grants program at some point to, to promote more sort of diversity. I don't know that I don't know how close we are to um, any of that. I know Jeremy Valverde was on here in the earlier part of the call and he might be able to speak to that. The grants uh, program is not something I'm specifically working on. So I don't have my fingers too deep in that. Yeah, Matt, I think I think the answer to that question is, is yes, we are as a department looking, looking into that. I think we're very cognizant of that issue and the history um with with growers and um there are ongoing talks about how to best address that equity issue um so it's a great question and we're definitely uh, working on it and recognizing it's an issue all right thank you both um another question here from amanda she said she asked can you discuss some of the difficulties that may arise from the federal government or just given that cannabis is not federally legal? Is that oh that boy. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, we can speak to a specific issue. Um, obviously there's, there's um, in, environmental issues associated with that. We, for example, there are certain situations in which we have um, activities that need a, a permitting or our CESA permitting, Endangered Species Act permitting from our department in order to operate. And some of those species are all also federally listed. And so it's been a very chronic issue for us to find ways to help those, um, those growers get through the permitting uh, hurdles because the federal government does not recognize um, cannabis as a legal activity. And as such, they're unable to grant um, any type of take coverage. Uh, so yeah, there, there's definitely multiple issues associated with that. And that's just one specific issue. Um, I don't know if anybody else has other examples of how that's been problematic for us. All right, we've got a couple more questions here. Alex asks, um, do you know of any restoration companies that are specifically designed to help growers restore and maintain habitat? Is that something that exists to your knowledge? I'm not familiar with a specific company. I know there are um, companies that do that work not specific to cannabis that are definitely available. Um, and there are there is a burgeoning consulting industry that assists with cannabis applications and operations. All right, next question here. Oh, let's see. Oh, and I see we have a comment too for this question that we asked a couple of questions ago. Jeremy said that we are we are looking at equity as it relates to our grant programs. Um, so that is something that we that is factored in. Um, let's see. So Sarah asks, and she says Sarah is an environmental planner. And um, was try let's see was trying to condition a cannabis grow to be required to obtain a surface water right for use on a shallow groundwater well about five feet, and so was defining the well as being hydrologically connected to the stream. The water board said water board said they're interpreting the water code conservatively and will not require a right for this well. And uh, she was told that DFW could enforce water rights on the shallow wells due to the likely impacts to stream habitat from well pumping. 
And Sarah's wondering if this is true. Corey, you want me to you want to speak to that? Or you want me to take it? <laughs> sure, sure. I'll try to I'll I'll try to answer that question. So, you know, our uh, authority under Section sixteen hundred um, existed prior to cannabis, um, and and we do apply it or attempt to uh, apply it consistently to all operations. Um, and as such, if your well is uh, substantially diverting. Uh, then it is, we could potentially uh, take that into consideration and term, uh, provide terms within our stream bed alteration agreement pr program that might uh, affect how that well is operated. Uh, those kinds of calls about whether or not things are hydrolog hydrologically connected and substantial are generally made by staff in the field. Um, but uh, as anybody can imagine, we're, we are dealing with thousands of these applications and that is kind of a, con a, a constant question. So I don't know if I quite answered that clearly, I'm pretty sure I didn't, but we, there's, there's a lot of um, variation. Um, there, there are differences between the, what the State Water Resources Control Board uh, decides to, um, cover under their authority. And if a well is within a subterranean stream, then generally they would need, you would need a water right for that well if it's diverting from a subterranean stream. Um, but the language from in their code is slightly different from our own stream bed alteration agreement program, where again, it's, it's whether it is a substantial diversion of water. And that in some cases can be um, hydrologically connected groundwater. Yeah, the only <clears throat> the only thing I would add, Corey, is just to echo that, and you sort of said it, but the water board's determination <clears throat> doesn't necessarily uh, control our determination. And as Corey said, that those that would be determined by sort of the facts on the ground, mm -hmm. and um, you know would be evaluated on a case by case basis. All right, thank you. Um, next question. Do illegal cultivators that reach out to legalize their cannabis cultivation receive the same penalties as cultivators that are caught? So the, the context of that question or the call of that question is a little confusing to me. I mean, you're basically uh, a cultivator that's already contacted us and or CDFA, which is now DCC, to try and get their cultivation on track mm -hmm. is probably not going to find itself subject to a search warrant and, um, you know, eradication of their plants necessarily. Although if they apply for, if they applied to CDFA and then they have plants in the ground before their application is, before their license is granted and they've jumped the gun then they could find themselves subject to enforcement action. But in general, um, the penalties are based on cultivation that violates the fish and game code, or at least the administrative penalties are. The health and safety code felony violations are based on unlawful cultivation that violates fish and game code. So there again, if you jump the gun before you have a license, then in theory, yes, you could be, that person could still be subject to felony enforcement. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of, I think your question implies that there's a timing element there and and that's sort of um that would it's going to depend case by case it's kind of a hard hypothetical to answer i guess yeah, that makes sense i think i could add a, a little bit to that um you know we're this is a growing program and a growing process no pun intended but we we're, we're constantly having conversations with landowners who are trying to come into compliance and, and we do recognize those that are, are doing their due diligence and their best um, to get their stream bed alteration agreements or their licenses from our from our department and other agencies. Um, so you can see from from our program, a vast majority of our resources uh, are attempting to get those attempting to work with growers and get them into the system and into compliance. Um, we have a lot of 
growers out there on the landscape that aren't even attempting um, to get uh, whether it's a license or a stream bed alteration agreement. And so there's plenty of work for us to do um, just targeting those, those types of growers for enforcement. All right, well, we have one more question here that I see, and I think it might be a good one um, for us to wrap up on. So Brad says, I have a background in wildland restoration and soils, and he's interested in the stewardship and restoration activities described in the presentation. How might one go about getting involved in this program? Well, great, Brad. Um, it would be great to have you involved in the program. In the program, um, I think for the purposes of restoration, um, it would probably be a good idea to, to reach out to um, our grants program coordinator or um, to, to see what opportunities are out there. Um, we're, we're just gonna continue, um, you know, continue to, to do our best to assist in those types of efforts. Um, so it's only gonna get bigger and better as we go. Yeah, and I think we have some kind of volunteer group opportunities as well with the broader department, but maybe some would be addressing this issue specifically. I'm not sure. Um, Janice, do you know of any kind of the resource volunteers or any anything that might be kind of geared towards restoration opportunities by chance? Yes, the natural resource program. Oh no, Janice, we can barely hear you. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm screaming into my microphone. I could put it in the chat. Oh, okay, great. Great, we heard that. So we'll we'll look for a link in the chat. You know, thank you. We'll we'll make sure to share that. All right. Well, I think that br brings us to the end of the questions here. Um, I really want to thank uh, everyone for asking this great range of questions, and also to all of our panelists. Really appreciate that all of you um, were willing to come on and and field these questions for us today. Um, Corey, any. Any last remarks, comments, thoughts you'd like to share before we close it out for today? No, I, I just want to thank you, Whitney and Nicole, for, for this opportunity. And I want to thank the large number of amazing people who helped put together this presentation. As you can imagine, there's a lot of work that our cannabis program does, and we're, we're very lucky to have a lot of amazing people kind of diligently trying to do their best. So... Uh, thank, thank you everyone for listening. Um, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, have a good afternoon. Great. Thank you, Corey. And um, I just noticed that um, Janice posted the link to our volunteer program in the chat box. So be sure to give that a look if you're interested. And thanks again, everyone for joining. Um, thank you so much, Corey, for um, presenting today. And uh, please do check out their recording. We'll have that posted to our website here in a couple of weeks. And feel free to, to point people to that if you know of someone who might be interested in the presentation today. Um, so thank you so much again. And we'll see you next time in August for the next lecture. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.